got the fire flow. Shorty getting down, going up the fire pole. Ready to go, in the middle where we mad go. I got the roll frog flow, you a tadpole. Do the love. Ah, uh, welcome to someone's favorite movie, the podcast where every movie is someone's favorite. I'm coming to you from the pod shack outside beautiful Flint, Michigan, USA. My name is Randy, and with me is a special guest, a film guy most epic, from the Epic Film Guys podcast, M-O-O-N, that spells Nick. Hey, buddy, what's going on? Laws, yes, Randy. Laws, Laws yes. yes. <laughs> oh. I'm finally here. I'm you are finally here. here on on someone's favorite movie. We finally shuffled Tom Cole. You know, out the door for for a hot minute. Yeah, Tom goes on assignment tonight, so he's I don't know what he's doing. Probably being cool and drinking craft beer somewhere and petting his Probably. dog. Probably. Who knows? Ugh. Probably. But thanks for being on my life for you. I can't believe your good friend director oh. Brennick made it on before you, but you know that's what happens. I guess Dan likes a lot of trashy movies. I mean, it makes sense to me. <laughs> that that is true. <laughs> <laughs> However, you you yourself should be coming a be becoming a huge fan of the trash because over on the Epic Guy, Film Guys podcast, you are co- covering Canon Films, <laughs> and that's right up our alley. I mean, that's that's my bread and butter over here. Stop reminding me. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, but you, but you found some uh, unexpected diamonds in the rough you didn't expect to true. enjoy. So very true. Ninja Ninja Three is. Wow. Like, you want to stand up on your couch and just clap the whole time that movie's playing just because there's ninjas just legitimately flying everywhere. I, what can What's better than that, honestly? Um, listen to you, Poo Poo, Masters of the Universe, while Justin fearlessly endorses it. That's podcasting gold right there. I mean, it was fine. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> Langell is great in it. I mean, I can't, I can't take that away from Frank Langella, but come on. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of these movies don't play all that well outside of like their original kind of time frame when they were originally released, you know? Yeah, that's true. I can't imagine some 16 year old today watching masters of the universe and being like, Oh man, I love this movie. It's really yeah. great. It's more it, to, no. Yeah. It's really nostalgic more than anything. That's that's what we play on here, nostalgia. Ooh. I do enjoy, however, finding like I don't know stuff that nobody's ever heard of before because it fascinates me how some movies find the backing, the gumption, just the sheer balls to exist in this universe. You gotta love the the what it must have taken for that filmmaker to go to to producers and production companies and pitch that movie just to try to get a little bit of budget and how hard it must have been for them to scrape together even the few meager hollywood pennies we'll say not just pennies overall but just to put that just to put some of those films together i've heard some of those films that you've talked about on this show and it's just like (laughs) right yeah i mean just imagine somebody making i don't know some roar for example that we covered on this podcast. Check it out in the archives. Thank you. Um, just as, you know, just listening to uh, Noel Marshall, like, describe that movie to his friends and them trying to be friends and being like, yeah, that's a great idea. And then afterwards going home and being like, oh, my God, what's what's wrong with him? He's insane. I mean, I'm more impressed with all the crew and all the actors in that movie who saw all of the live animals and were just like, yeah, this seems like a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> I would have been gone after the first maiming. I mean, that's when I would <laughs> be like, yeah, I'm out. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, oh, Jesus. Yeah. I can't even. But today we're covering a movie that's, uh, well, it's not even a movie, really. We're bending the rules a bit. It's more of a mini series, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is something you've all heard of, I'm sure. It's called The Stand. It was everybody loves The Stand, right? It's Stephen King's epic tale of Good versus Evil. It's a 1994 mini mini series version of it, and uh, I have no idea how long this podcast is going to go. Could be an hour, could be three, but we're just gonna let it fly. Hope you enjoy listening it, to it as much as listening to Baby Can You Dig Your Man on repeat over and over. Baby, forever. can you dig your man? Oh, thank you, Larry Underwood. Oh. 
So, Nick, I went back and I had to look at our initial combos regarding doing the stand on this podcast. And they went way back to September of last year, before this podcast yeah. even existed. And, uh, I mean, there's been numerous delays due to life stuff, holiday stuff, and, oh, yeah, coronavirus. It seemed in bad taste to do it, but we're doing it anyways now. Whatever. Which is, you know, nobody else cared that it was in bad or strange taste of just like, as soon as, as soon as the real life pandemic hit, everyone was like, what pandemic movies can we review right now? Which is awful. I don't understand. I still don't understand that mindset. I just, I don't get it. Someone please explain it to me. Cause the last thing I want to think of is like world ending, like worst case, like outbreak and pandemic type scenarios when we're dealing with it in, in real life. Now the stand I feel like is removed enough from that where I, I could still enjoy it because then it involves all the spiritual elements and everything else. And you know, coronavirus is no captain trips. No, it is sure. not captain trips. <laughs> the stand, this mini series is actually what brought me to Stephen King in 1994 there was an entire wave of king miniseries in the 90s there was it there was a tv movie called sometimes they come back there was the tommy knockers the langoliers the stand a king improved remake of the shining storm of the century desperation oh my god i could go on and on but this 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 miniseries it really captured my imagination it drove me to seek out more stephen king so i went back and i read salem's lot then the shining carrie misery cujo it all of that Wow. I know, right? What about you, Nick? Were you ever a Stephen King fan? Are you still a Stephen King fan? Have you ever read Stephen King? I've read some of King's short stories and whatnot. Like when I was in college and I was, you know, getting my beautiful, wonderful English degree that is glaring at me right now. But <laughs> I, I read a lot of like King's short stories and, and things like that. But any of his longer works, any of the stuff that the movies are based on, no. And I think this is probably my first exposure to King as well. But it didn't have the effect in you, or in me, excuse me, that it had on you. I watched this miniseries, and then I watched it again, and then I watched it again, and I watched it again, and I watched it again. I just, I never got into any other King stuff, because I know he was really, really big at the time. And now, of course, he's in a huge kind of resurgence where all of his properties are getting new adaptations and whatnot, including the stand. Right. So, you know, no, I just, I, I saw this mini series and I just glued myself to it. And now even like, I mean, I loved the, the new adaptations of it that we got from mm -hmm. Andy Muschietti. I loved both of those films, but you know, it's not anything that makes me, I, I'm a, I'm a like, I, if I'm going to read a book, I'm just going to read a book because I want to read a book. Unless it's something that really, and I mean really, really captivates me. Like uh, when I first saw the trailer for Cloud Atlas, I immediately bought the book by David Mitchell. Oh, okay. And immediately powerhoused my way through it. And, you know, nothing that King, that I've ever seen from King has ever made me want to do that. I got to him in junior high, high school, and then I got into college and I was a fancy, fancy boy. Also pursued pursuing one of those fancy amazing english degrees which you have on your wall Ooh. yeah right and uh i got a little bit too pretentious for the stephen king because he was not proper literature Ooh. so i kind of abolished stephen king from my life in favor of more heady existential angsty stuff and then i found myself drifting in and out and i'm telling you watching this again after all these years reignited my love of the stephen king so i read the stand finally i had started reading it after watching this miniseries and threw it aside because i was hoping it was a little bit different from the miniseries because one of my favorite characters dies in the movie and i was hoping that it was different in the book and it wasn't uh, uh, spoiler alert geez. i know right but anyways i went back i read the stand to prepare for this podcast i'm glad i did it um and it's very close to the mini mini series there's some characters that are left out some scenes that just don't show up due to time constraints um but overall it's extremely faithful to the book which it should be because the screenplay was written by one stephen king so if you don't know what the stand is, dear listener, it's pretty much Stephen King's version of Lord of the Rings, 
It's uh, it's a story of good versus evil. It's about a mutating super flu, which is dubbed Captain Trips. And the flu pretty mm-hmm. quickly wipes out most of humanity, except for certain people who seem to have a natural immunity to it. Also wipes out most of the domesticated animals like dogs and horses, but leaves wild animals like deer, wolves, weasels, birds, etc. Um... That's too far. You take the people, fine, but not the dogs. Don't you dare. Don't take those dogs. I mean, all of this sounds very familiar to the coronavirus, and poor Stephen King has to... It's pretty bad when you turn to a horror writer to comment on the recent happenings in the world. Uh, He he was on NPR with Terry Gross, and he, he said, I keep having people say, gee, it's like we're living in a Stephen King story. My only response to that is, I'm sorry. Which, what the hell? Wow, this is a unprofessional. You call yourself a podcast pro, and I'm leaving that wow. in so everyone knows what an amateur you are. Wow, it's just wow. the ladies blowing up those phones, those phones <laughs> right there. I I wish I <laughs> wish that's what it was. Uh, King, to understand what I'm going through right now, dear listeners, go queue up some old episodes of Miserable Retail Slaves, circa 2018, yeah. somewhere back in that era, era, you know, and listen to Randy's online dating stories. That'll about cover it. That will cover it. Uh, <sighs> things got so bad that uh, King actually posted Chapter 8 of The Stand on Twitter, which is a chapter that explains how diseases are spread. And in the book, he compares it to a chain letter. And I'm going to read it to you real quick. Uh, Joe Bob felt fine. Joe Bob is like a, an officer that visits uh, a gas station in uh, Texas where Stu Redman is, who becomes a main character. Anyways, Joe Bob felt fine. Dying was the last thing on his mind. Nevertheless, he was already a sick man. He had gotten more than gas at Bill Hapscomb's Texaco, and he gave Harry Trent more than his speeding summons. Harry, a gregarious man who liked his job, passed the sickness to more than 40 people during that day and the next. How many of those 40 passed it to is impossible to say. You might as well ask how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. If you were to make a conservative estimate of five apiece, you'd have 200. Using the same conservative formula, one could say those 200 went on to infect 1,000, the 1,000, 5,000, the 5,000, 25,000, under the California desert and subsidized by the taxpayers' money, someone had finally invented a chain letter that finally worked. A very lethal chain letter. <laughs> and there we go. That's how diseases spread, in case you didn't know. I mean I saw back when the when the coronavirus first hit, I saw like a lot of people were saying things like this is just like this stand. And he actually posted on his Twitter, the coronavirus is nothing like this state. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like, the coronavirus does not, if, if the coronavirus was like captain trips, then there would be no sense in wearing a mask or quarantining yourself or literally doing anything because it's got a 99.9% lethality rate. If you catch it, which it transmits via like literally any and every means. Right. And it constantly mutates to, you know, do all the different things to, like, defeat your immune system. I can't remember reading. I I read some stuff about exactly how the virus works and whatnot. Uh, The way that it constantly mutates to, like, avoid your body's ability to fight it. Like, no, people, no. Just no. No. No, we never, like, if, if anything, like, what happens in the stand ever actually happened in real life, then that legitimately would be the end of civilization as we know it. <laughs> no, it would because people can't even handle the coronavirus. So I don't know that's, what would. That's true. I, I don't know what would happen if it was worse. Worst? Worse. God, words are hard. That English wow. degree on my wall is withering mm-hmm. right now in pain. Mm-hmm. Crying and, a little bit. Yeah. Anyways, the people who are left, they start to have dreams. One of the dreams is about a a 108-year-old African-American woman who lives in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska. She's strong. Come see me, Randy. You and all your friends. Oh, that was a pretty good impression of a Ruby D there. Her name is Mother Abigail. She strums gospel songs on her porch and urges folks to come see her. And also, she makes her own bread still. 
I still make my own bread. I laugh so hard. I love that character so much. It's a uh, great character. Uh, the other great character is uh, the faceless man, the man in black. Uh, other people are having dreams of this guy, and they're more of a nightmare. His name's Randall Flagg, and folks gravitate to one or the other primarily based on their character. And, of course, the two groups are destined to collide and there we go. We have it. Thank God it was some kindly old woman strumming those songs and not like, I don't know, Axl Rose or something. Like, would you, <laughs> the world would have been doomed. Would you follow Axl Rose, Nick? Would you? Every, everybody's going to Vegas. No, like literally he'd be in Boulder by himself, just sitting there being like, where, where is everybody? Yeah. Well, Axl's like, do you know where you are? <laughs> you were in the jungle, baby. <laughs> now you're going to die. <laughs> They're like, we'll no t- one would show up we'll, literally we'll, ever. We'll take our chances with the demon guy, okay? Yep. You go squeal to yourself there, Axel. He looks he looks damn good in those jeans. So, I mean, you know. Sure. Why not? Uh, those are the most 90s. Like, that's one of the things when I watch this miniseries again. That's one of the most 90s things in this miniseries is those jeans, man. Those jeans are the most 90s jeans ever. And he wears them like a champion. Damn, Randall Flagg. That like, ass. Man. I like the way you fill out those jeans, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but I think the stand actually paved the way for such things as Lost in The Walking Dead. Like big ensemble cast, high concepts, fate of the world, good versus evil. Am I wrong? I would, I would definitely say there has to be some influence. Has to be. Uh, actually, reading the book, The Walking Dead, that exact phrase is used several times. So I'm wondering if that was somewhat of an inspiration to old Robert Kirkman, who created that mm-hmm. series. Um, the Stand, the origin of it. Do you want to know the origin of The Stand, or is that boring? I would love to. Okay. Because I, I specifically don't know. Okay. So in the, in the uh, book... Denze Macabre, which is a kind of a nonfiction book that Stephen King wrote about horror. It's like horror essays. Um, he wrote The Stand after reading about a chemical spill in Utah. And he says, all the bad, nasty bugs got out of their canister and killed a bunch of sheep. But the news article stated, if the wind had been blowing the other way, the good people of Salt Lake City might have gotten a very nasty surprise. And at the same time, he was actually living in Boulder, Colorado, and he used to listen to a uh, a Christian station for whatever reason. And one day, he says, I heard a, p- a preacher delating upon the text, once in every generation the plague will fall among them. I like the sound of the phrase, which sounds like a biblical quotation, but is not. So well that I wrote it down and tacked it over my typewriter. Once in every generation the plague will fall among them. He also was influenced by a book called Earth Abides by George Stewart, which is about the last man on Earth. And basically, he combined all the things together to get The Stand. Wow. Yeah. In a podcast interview with Mick Garris, who directed The Stand, uh, on Garris's postmortem podcast, um, King said he nearly stopped writing The Stand because there were too many characters, so much so that it started to become unwieldy. So he just put it away because, you know, he, he didn't know what to do all, with all the characters, which I would think would be a problem with adapting it for a screen. But I think the miniseries pulls it off pretty well, don't you? I think, yeah. I mean, there are some characters uh, we talked a little bit before we recorded. There are some characters that get the shaft here, uh, especially, you know, if if they're members of the Boulder, like the Free Zone Committee. But we don't know literally anything about their characters like that's a little bit of a failing. But given the constraints of adapting a novel of this size into four parts of a television miniseries, you know, there are a lot of characters that really get a good amount of depth here. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does a pretty great job. Um, the stand aired on ABC from May 8th to May 12th, 1994. It was nominated for six primetime Emmys, had a budget of $28 million, which is great. They weren't, they weren't pinching pennies for this one. Um, what do you think of the score? I know you talk about score a lot on Epic Film, guys. Does the score strike you at all for the the stand? I mean, a little, I guess. 
a little bit. I mean, like there there are some memorable you know songs on the soundtrack. Yeah. That, that, that pop in there. I mean, you know, we we'll, we won't talk about Larry right now, but you know, there are some good, you know, actually like popular hits. Like, I mean, it's I I want like when the 2020 version of this comes out, they have to include "Don't Fear the Reaper" in there somewhere because it's so. Every time I hear that song, I think of this miniseries. Like that's what ties that song to this miniseries for me. It's just like you see the crow, you know, Randall flag, you know, at the, at the, at the facility where the virus is released, walking across the road and just, you know, that part of the song where it's like, do you knew 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 like that yeah. whole thing? Like that's like indelibly like burned into my brain. So it uses some popular music and everything really, really well. And, um, I think the score, I think the best parts of it really start to hit once the, once the four guys leave Boulder and head to Vegas, like, uh, Mother Abigail sends them on their charge to go confront Flag mm-hmm. at the end of the third chapter, and then then you get that big swelling score. Like that's great, but like it's just not really all that present up until that for me. Like that was kind of I'd be honest. Like when I watched it, I sat and watched it all in one shot, like I told you, and that was really the first time I noticed it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Don't fear the reapers. Basically, in the very beginning of the show, when the virus yep. is unreached unleashed uh don't fear the reaper by blue oyster cult plays and it shows all these images of uh people just dead where they wherever whatever they were doing they dropped dead in this facility um one guy escapes from the military compound and he goes to texas to spread the disease which is the chain letter that uh stephen king wrote about really um it also yeah i can't really remember the scene where it kicks in but uh i think it's the beginning of the second chapter when uh, crowded houses don't dream it's over kicks in is it the second yeah that, yeah i think so yeah um it, it was just the montage i thought that was very effective i feel like randall flag has his own theme in this too They're like a twanging guitar kind of yeah. folksy i love that every time he's on screen or comes around uh, I mean, we should talk about Randall Flagg. He's probably my favorite part of this this entire thing. Uh, Sheridan is great, absolutely great in this miniseries. Like he he plays the part really, really well because he he does have kind of a trusting nature to him. Like he seems like you know he's got like a a, a very generally pleasant demeanor to him and everything. Yeah, he seems like somebody you'd want to trust until all of a sudden his eyes start to glow or until his face morphs into a demon face in some it very admittedly shoddy, like mid nineties television CGI. But I mean, for what they were able to do in this, like for a $28 million budget for this, a six hour mini series. I mean, it's fine. I, I don't, I don't fault it for that at all, but no, especially it, not in 1994. Yeah. It does look really funny whenever he transforms into the demon version of like every time I just laughed I, when I was watching it. Yeah. I, I read the, <laughs> whoever designed the makeup effects wanted him to look like a goat a cross between mm-hmm. a, a goat and a human. And I yeah. guess they achieved that, but it looks dumb. They honestly, we talked about this before we started recording. They didn't need any uh, effects on Jamie Sheridan. He looks creepy as it is. Yeah, he does. He's got that 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 smile, that crooked smile. That's just yeah. Oh, uh, he flashes the he flashes that smile at you, and you you're just like, uh, yeah, no. It, it's definitely unsettling. Um, yeah. The, the first time we see Randall Flag, this devil wears a mullet. He's got this massive mullet. He points a finger gun at a deer and kills it, planning to eat it. And he starts hearing the monster shouter in New York City somehow, played by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, saying the dark man is near. And uh, Randall Flagg causes poor Kareem to have a heart attack from afar. Man. I just like, Bring out your dead indeed. Yes. I just like the idea of, like, a demon marching down the back roads of America in all his denim glory, just causing chaos <laughs> wherever he goes. I, <laughs> I like that. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why there's not a Funko Pop of Randall Flag because I would own it Im- immediately. I mean, it really should be. There it should really be. should. I don't know how a Funko would capture the gloriousness of the jeans. <laughs> right. Would have to find a way. They'd have to find a way. There. 
Uh, he's so good in this though. He is really, really, really good in this because he's able to he's able to crank up the the anger and the emotion when he needs to, but he's able I mean again, he has that that nature to him when you know, I mean, again, we see it. I mean, I think we probably see a little bit of it and we just think his eyes are going to start glowing or whatever too. But he just, he seems like he's like when he goes to meet Lloyd in the prison, you know, when Lloyd's trapped in prison and he goes in there, you know, he seems like he's like the greatest guy in the world. Right. You know? And I mean, when you're trapped in a prison cell, eating a rat raw, you know, you'll probably do pretty much anything, but Hey, <laughs> Actually, in the book, it elaborates that on on that a little bit more. He was about to eat uh, the leg of the inmate in the cell next to him, um, because I think it alludes to that. Yeah, a little the, bit in the in the thing, but it doesn't actually like it, it doesn't actually obviously go into that kind of depth or anything. Like we don't hear about that or we don't see that. Right. Um, I'm telling you, if there was a Stephen King fighting game, Randall Flag would be my final boss. And I would buy that game. You'd have Pennywise, Randall Flagg, Carrie Cujo, Annie Wilkes from Misery, Jack Torrance from The Shining, Danny Torrance, Red Roan, some children of the corn, a fire starter, Christine the Car, John Coffee. It'd be amazing. Who wouldn't buy I that? I love it. By the way, I can't believe there's never been a Pennywise versus Randall Flagg movie. Can't believe no one's pitched that. However, since Alexander Skarsgård is playing Randall Flagg in the new the Stan miniseries and his brother Bill was Pennywise. Let's get it done, huh? I yes. Just as yes. a total geeky thing, let's do it. And this is a, this is a this is a you know a character that has appeared across other King stories. I think think probably most notably in the Dark Tower, but I know he's in other King stuff as well. He was he was in the Dark Tower as the Man in Black. He was in um, the Eye of the Dragon as Flag. That's right, yeah. He uh, as a magician. Um, he appears in Gwendy's button box. Uh, and that's really one of the great things that drew me to Stephen King is the continuity. I'm a big comic book, Marvel comic geek and continuity was always like key to that. So anytime there's any sort of like crossover appeal, I love it. Yeah. Um, Randall Flagg's been called the dark man, the man with no face, the hard case, the walking dude, which is such a Stephen Kingism, I can't even deal with it. Uh, <laughs> but he first appeared in 1969. Stephen King wrote a, a poem called The Dark Man. And his idea from the poem came out of nowhere. He said, this guy in cowboy boots who moved around on the roads, mostly hitchhiking at night, always wore jeans and a denim jacket. The thing about him that really attracted me was the idea of the villain as someone who was always on the outside looking in, and hated people who had good fellowship and good conversation and friends. I kind of like what you said about Randall Flagg, how he he's very like charming. Like Men and women alike seem to be very drawn to him. I think mm. if there was an actual devil, that's exactly what the devil would be, right? Very charming and prone to temper tantrums and throwing a fit like a two-year-old as well. I, oh, yeah, you'd have to believe so, yeah. Yeah. Um in the stand book, he describes Randall Flagg as a tall man of no age in faded peg jeans and a denim jacket. His pockets were stuffed with 50 different kinds of conflicting literature, pamphlets for all seasons, rhetoric for all reasons. When this man handed you a tract, you took it no matter what the subject. I kind of love the idea that he's handing out pamphlets of, like, random hate things. Um, I feel like he's, like, one of those people that goes to, like, carnivals or goes to, like, other events and hangs out those little... Those little like comic book church booklet things, yeah, yeah, like exactly. Ten pages long, exactly. And um, that are hilarious. If you've ever read one of those things, they are hilarious. Uh, he's described as a he was a clot looking for a place to happen, happen, a splinter of bone hunting a soft organ to puncture, a lonely lunatic cell looking for a mate that they would set up housekeeping and raise themselves a cozy little malignant tumor. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Yeah. Likewise, he never spoke at rallies because the microphones would scream with hysterical feedback and circuits would blow. But he had written speeches for those who did speak. And on several occasions, those speeches had ended in riots, overturned cars, student strike votes, and violent demonstrations. So he's not the man that causes the violence. He cause, makes other people do the violence for him, which is great. Par for the course. 
par for the course. Um, <clears throat> Captain Trips, actually, the virus, at first appears in a short story called Night Surf from 1969 that King wrote. It's also about a group of survivors trying to go about life in a world in which humanity has been wiped out by disease. So that's a thing that exists. And going with the crossover idea, some have said that Mother Abigail has The Shining based on this line in the book. She says, prophecy is the gift of God and everyone has a smidge of it. My own grandmother used to call it the shining lamp of God, sometimes just the shine. Hmm. Yeah, The Shining is something that it, it also appears in It, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the character, one of the main characters, uh, Dick Halloran, who is in The Shining and uh, Doctor Sleep, he shows up in it. I want to say he shows up in the book Insomnia too, if I remember right. Um, one of the interesting things I thought, and this is like a fan theory or whatever, uh, Randall Flagg is constantly changing his name, at, both in the book and the movie, but the, his initials always start with RF. One of the the names he chooses is Richard Fremantle, and Mother Abigail Gale's last name is Fremantle. And in the book, she talks about having a uh, younger br- brother named Richard who uh, saved her from a uh, attack of weasels. She was reaching under a porch, and a weasel bit on her arm, and her younger brother Richard Fremantle saved Mother Abigail. So there's all sorts of... Uh, rumor and speculation that uh, maybe Randall Flagg is Mother Abigail's brother, which is, I don't know, two sides of the coin? I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, because he does, he, Richard Fremantle is listed as one of his aliases, so I don't know. who, Whatever. Who cares? Mm. Maybe he appeared to Mother Abigail in that form and tried to, like, corrupt her or scare her away from whatever or something. I don't know. Maybe so. In the Weird. book, in the book, it says that he does not remember where he comes from. He has no idea. He just walks the earth and whatever. So this cast, right? Pretty good, pretty great. This cast is fantastic, with a couple of glaring exceptions, which we'll talk about. <laughs> fantastic, from mostly top to bottom. I mean, you can't like there are a lot of and, and because it's I mean, it's a TV miniseries where you've got a lot of characters to juggle, but you still get a lot of really memorable performances in this performances that kind of, you know, you still remember them. They stay with you mm-hmm. like even after you're done watching it. Aside from Sheridan, like you think about Bill Fagerbach as Tom Cullen, like he's my favorite character in this in this always stays with you like whatever you know i mean well we when we even like first started talking about doing it or even when i see random stuff pop up on twitter sometimes i'll just be like m-o-o-n you know i mean it's just it's so and he's like the perfect perfect actor to play that kind of character uh because he's a mentally challenged character yeah you know and 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 bill fagerbach he just has that voice i mean he went on to voice patrick star for literally five thousand years now (laughs) Who right. is also a mentally challenged yeah. character on you know, SpongeBob just, SquarePants? For those who don't know, even that—that that was even his shtick in Coach too. Like even even Dauber, in good Coach old Dauber, was, yeah, was not uh, was not quite all there. And uh, I think poor poor Bill—he's just got that. It's just the way his voice sounds. He just sounds, for lack of a better term, and don't crucify me for it, but for lack of a better term, he just sounds simple. Yeah, like his voice, like he just sounds, you know, like whatever if yeah. that makes sense yeah uh, he he does such a great job in this movie he's so likable oh, he's so good uh, yeah he he kills it and you're right m- me and my, my cousin and i have done that m-o-o-n thing ever since this the miniseries came out like randomly yeah. you know it, it's it's one of those things that really sticks with you like you said gary sinise as Stu redmond Man. east texas east texas he had a pretty good 1994. He was in this and a little movie called Forrest Gump, which he was nominated for a Academy Award for. Uh, you realize how freaking good he is in this movie when he's acting opposite of Stephen King near the end of the movie? Uh, <laughs> it's like Stephen uh, King, get, you don't even belong in the same scene as this man. He's just no. emoting and caring and wanting to get to Franny and you're just 
blocking everybody with your bad performance, Stephen King. I understand that you wanted to be in the movie, but you could have been a background character or something. You didn't have to have lines. The same thing happens when he's in the car with Nadine and they're on their way to Boulder. He is is just excruciating to watch as he's delivering the dialogue. It's just like, just, just come on, Stephen, just stop it. And it's like he, Stop it. he gave could him have done a cameo. You could have just appeared randomly and not headlines. And it's like he gave himself the worst dialogue too. Like he he's talking to Nadine and he's like something something wowzers. And I'm like nobody says wowzers in real life. Who are you? <laughs> what, why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> Give yourself something cool to say for crying out loud. It's like come on, like you got to be kidding. It's he's yeah he is insufferably bad. He is terrible. Yeah. Um, Rob Lowe is Nick Andros, and he does a lot with nothing. He plays a deaf and mute man, um, and I think he does. He he also gives a good performance, considering he He's has to do a lot with so good with facial expressions and um, just body language. And he is actually another one of my favorite characters who who gets killed in this movie, and that's the one that sets me off. I was hoping that you know in the book it was a little bit different. It's not, and it makes me mad. It's so it's heartbreaking too. It's it's really yeah. really heartbreaking because he like he and Tom are easily like two of the most endearing characters in the miniseries. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, I mean, like really, you gravitate toward them because they seem they are so good and they are so sweet and like you you know you have like your goodness and like a lot of the other characters that end up going to Boulder and to Mother Abigail and whatnot. But these are like the two most like pure good characters. Yeah. In in the story and they're just so like they make this amazing duo like you love like when he first meets tom cullen and tom's got all the mannequins and everything like all out in the street and he's talking about like oh everybody just went up to tulsa or wherever he says oh yeah kansas city everybody just went up everybody went up to kansas city like and you know you you just you immediately just latch on to that character and and you love that 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 nick is like yeah come along let's go yeah. you know you can you can you can come with me and then i love this scene where when they run into ralph along the side of the road he still has never learned nick's name right in, in all this but then you know ralph tells him when when nick writes the message to him says they're going to boulder or whatnot and then, and then he grabs his hand and he shakes it so excitedly and so happily like they're just two of the sweetest like if they would have killed tom collin like in this story like when he goes to be one of the spies, mm-hmm. you know, to to spy on Vegas. If they'd have killed Tom Cullen, ooh, I would, man, <laughs> I would be so mad. Yeah, uh, he he. At one point, the Boulder Group sends spies to Las Vegas, and Tom Cullen is one of them because they're trying to send people that Flag would not assume they would send. So they send Tom Cullen because of his disability, yep. and it turns out to be a good move because. Randall Flagg can't read Tom Cullen's mind whatsoever. It's either because he's, quote, simple, or he's uh, so pure and innocent that he just can't, or it's the fact that he says M-O-O-N all the time, and all Randall Flagg all can see is a moon. he sees is the moon. Yeah. So it, it's really great, and I hope in the uh, miniseries that's coming up on CBS All Access, since they have more time, we get to spend more time with Nick Andros and Tom Cullen. Because there is a scene in the book where uh, it's an extended scene when they're trying to they're making a road trip to Mother Abigail and they get attacked by a tornado, which Tom Cullen sees from a mile away. He's like, "There's a tornado. We got to go." And Nick doesn't believe him, and sure enough, there's a tornado coming. And uh, it's speculated that Randall Flagg is actually in that tornado and is trying to kill them. And it's a really tense and kind of scary scene. And I. I would love to see that uh, brought to life. That would be great, especially any more scenes with these two. Hopefully the actors do them justice. It's one of those, and I I guess we could probably get into it later when we get, when we get out of the cast stuff, but it's one of those things. There's, there's a lot of unevenness in this mini series just based on the whole man in black thing. Like, and, and I guess maybe you'll have to tell me because you've read the book, but I hope this is something that they think about, if not for the for the new miniseries that they do. But like we see him just randomly, like you know, killing a deer and like chawing on a deer, and he hears just Kareem Abdul Jabbar in his head, and yeah. just Kills causes him. him to have a heart attack and die. Like 
for me, it's like he knows these people. He knows who's going to see Mother Abigail and who's not. He knows yes. who's going where. Like, if he's got this power to just, like, think about somebody having a heart attack and their heart explodes, why does he just kill everybody? Right. And that's a minute. Like, are they protected somehow by, like, the hand of God or whatever that keeps them safe, like, so he can't directly? Because, I mean, we know Kareem's not, you know, one of the, one of the survivors or whatever. Right. But... You know, I just, well, actually, we don't know because he died from the, you know, he died from Randall Flack. He didn't die from the, from the super flow. So I don't know. It's it's one of those weird things. Like, does the book mention anything about that or no? No, not at all. That was a uh, purely uh, thing for the miniseries. Um, Larry Underwood. I've always wondered that. that yeah. Like, why doesn't he just, if he can kill people with just thinking right. about it from afar, or if he can, like, like when he kills Harold, which is the greatest scene in this entire miniseries, by, by the way, mm-hmm. but when he kills Harold, like, he doesn't actually kill him, but he appears in the middle of the road and causes him to swerve off the road and get into a bike accident. You know? Like, why doesn't he more directly interfere with more of the other survivors to get rid of them? Yeah, uh, as far as that goes, he never, like like his description says, he never really inflicts violence on anybody. He makes other people do it for him. So that scene of him causing the heart attack is just out of place. It never happens in the book. The, there's one exception that he actually kills somebody, and it's one of his flunkies from Vegas who uh, is said to sent to kill the judge who... Flag knows is one of the spies, and he wants the head intact because he wants to send it over to the the Boulder Free Zone to send a message to stop fucking with Randall Flag. Well, his flunky shoots him in the head and ruins the thing, and so Flag actually grows teeth and bites a guy's throat out in the book. That's yeah. the only time he actually attacks somebody. So. I well, think, that's the only time he kill. Well, uh, he kills him directly in the miniseries too. It's yeah. Sam Raimi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it really i didn't even realize yeah, it's, that it's sam raimi and, and i and i saw him when i saw him and i'm not familiar with what a young sam raimi looks like but yeah. i know what like older sam raimi looks like and as soon as i looked at him i'm like is that sam raimi and then i you know i double checked it just to make sure and sure enough it is sam raimi indeed that is you know he's the one that flag kills because yeah. uh, the other guy gets killed by raimi because he like just is trigger happy and just like starts right. like blasting away and just mows down the other guy i know john landis is in this too but i never i don't know i guess i wasn't paying attention close enough to to spot him i know what john landis looks like but i didn't uh, and if it was ted ramey i would have known in an instant but sam but I, who wouldn't have yeah, yeah. <laughs> sam no but yeah i think that was just a, a plot device for the uh miniseries just to show how dangerous and deadly and powerful randall flag was yeah yeah, I didn't know if it, yeah, I was just like, man, like, are they all just like protected or whatnot? And it's just like, but or is he that arrogant that he would rather just see if he can sway them with, you know, earthly desires like he ends up doing to Harold because Harold's jealous because he's trying to bat way out of his league and has no shot in hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, the judge in this movie or in the miniseries is played by Ossie Smith, who's married to Ruby D, who plays Mother Abigail in this. Yep. And I feel like we get no sort of backstory on Mother Abigail in the miniseries whatsoever, which nothing. is a shame. She's a very interesting character. You know nothing about her. Yeah, we get nothing on Mother Abigail. We, and, and this is the same thing with a lot of characters. We don't get anything on the judge. We don't get anything on Mother Abigail. We don't get anything. We talked about Ralph before we recorded, but you don't get anything about Ralph. You don't get anything about a lot of characters that mm-hmm. really at least have at least some kind of pivotal moment in the plot where they should have gotten a little bit more depth right. a little bit more development especially mother abigail like how like she's basically just kind of a plot device to bring them all together in yeah. the miniseries that's all she's really relegated to it's just she's so charming and she's 108 years old and still makes her own bread that you can't help but love her Ugh. one of the uh creepiest scenes in this for me is that scene where mother abigail is playing gospel hymns and she's mm-hmm. facing off with Randall Flagg in the corn there, and her hand starts bleeding and splashing blood everywhere. Yeah. Oh, and then she prays to God to take it away, and it vanishes. But I'm like, that's yep. so awesome. And so also so ballsy, because this was shown on ABC, which is not known to like show violence like that, or at least back yep. then anyways. This was the network of home improvement and shit. 
like uh, in TGIF, we didn't do things like that. So uh, I I wish they would have included more Mother Abigail, but you know, we have Laura San Giacomo who plays Nadine Cross, who back then and still now is Hey Girl Hey, young hey teenage girl Hey, young teenage Randy was smitten with this woman in this miniseries. And I still was smitten when I watched it again. Um, we get no motivation as to why she thinks she is belongs to Randall Flagg, but that's her whole reason to exist. It's it's another one of those things that I'm hoping that maybe the new mini series, like we get a little bit more that kind of fleshes that out. Also, and I don't know if this is a performance issue or if it's a writing issue, but her character is very uneven for me. Like there are times when it seems like, like she, like in chapter three, she goes to Larry and basically like she tells Larry, like if you, if you have sex with me, if you sleep with me, then I I can stay here. Like I don't have to leave. I can stay here. So is it like, is it, is she still a virgin? And she's like this virginal, whatever, who's going to be the vessel for Randall flags, demon spawn, antichrist baby or whatever. Or like, you know, like, it, but then the character, like, there are times when she seems like, I, I don't know, like, there's just not enough depth to that character, I don't think, where sometimes it seems like she's all about Flag and she's all about, like, being his flunky. And then there's times that she seems like she's completely not all about that, at least until, you know, he rapes her and then, you know, she goes catatonic until she kills herself, which is also, like, I think that character has a great finale, mm-hmm. but I don't really like the way that that character is built up throughout the rest of it because it, it it just feels uneven it feels like there needs to be a little bit more meat to that so here's the problem with that character it's a combination of two characters that king decided to put together in this miniseries initially larry underwood who we'll get to he meets another woman named rita in new york before he meets nadine mm. so sting stephen king decided to combine the two i know because of of time constraints. Um, but in the book, it's also said that and this motivation is really dumb. Uh, when Nadine was young, her and her friends were playing with a Ouija board and it said that she belonged to Randall flag when they were playing with the Ouija board. And that's why she belongs to Randall flag. She believes. Um, I think the interesting thing, like I'm looking at the cast list of the, 2020 you know limited series which is going to be coming we don't know when sometime later this year they Mm -hmm. think because it wrapped production in march but uh rita is going to be a character in the 2020 one she's going to be a character in it so okay um, yeah maybe maybe they're actually going to kind of flesh that out more and we're actually going to get to see more of that in the in in the uh in the in the miniseries but we'll see i hope so um but i like her character arc her ending anyways she takes it into her own hands. She decides to, she gets raped by Randall Flagg. She's basically catatonic. She decides to foil his plan by committing suicide, jumping off a tall building. She doesn't get that option in the book. In the book, Randall Flagg throws her off the the building in a fit of rage, not thinking, just throwing a temper tantrum. So she never gets control of her own destiny or character in the book. I feel like hmm. this was a better ending for her to take it back. I kind of like that too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Larry Underwood, he's played by, who's he played by, damn it? Uh, where is he? Adam Stork. Okay. Larry Underwood is one of my favorite characters in the book, and I hate him in this. I cannot, thank you so much. I can't stand his character in the miniseries. Larry Underwood in the book is writ- written so that you think, initially that Larry Underwood is the main character of the book until until you realize that no it's Stu Redman but he's given that much importance and he seems like he he's got flaws he's a drug drug addict he's a rock star but also he's trying to be better um the way that Adam Stork plays him he, he just plays him straight up as a dick and yeah. one of the things that happens in the book that kind of makes Larry Underwood a better character I guess is is that Rita character that I mentioned? He's with this Rita chick, and uh, they 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 try to escape New York and all this. 
and she commits suicide. She takes too many pills, commits suicide, and he's torn up about it, and it's a really good character moment for him, which he never gets in the miniseries. He's thrust into this uh, circle of importance at the end, and it doesn't feel earned. Like, no. He doesn't have a, a proper character arc. He was a dick, and then all of a sudden he shows up in Boulder, and he's, I don't know, a good guy? I don't know. Yeah, he just seems like, and and they leaned way too hard on the stereotypical New Yorker kind of thing mm-hmm. for the character, for the performance in the miniseries. I don't know if that's the way the character is written in the book, but Stork is in a performance just leans way, way too hard into it. Like he is legitimately the stereotypical New Yorker. He's an asshole just for the sake of being an asshole. Yeah. Literally, literally no other reason. Like he just, he's, he's abrupt. He, he, he's like just such a dick. You're right. He's just such a dick. And like when he, all of a sudden he's like literally the number two on the free zone committee. Like Mm -hmm. he's literally like right behind Stu. And like, he's this big, all important character that gets sent off with, you know, Stu and Ralph and, uh, uh, God, Ray Walston's character. I can't remember the name right now. Glenn, that's what it is. He gets he, like, and it's like, well, wait, what really? But I mean, I guess when you kill off Nick and you have Tom Cullen going under as a spy and right. all those other things and Franny is knocked up, so you can't send Franny and Harold blows his brains out. Thank the Lord. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess Larry is the only one you got left, but yeah, like he, he, he seems, you're right. He seems to have this place of importance in the story. It's not conveyed well enough at all in the writing and definitely not in the performance. This is one of the performances I absolutely hate in this miniseries. And it's one of those things that like when you watch it, it just, it, it makes me just cringe a little bit. It's just like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. It, good. Another Larry scene. Yeah. Um, and in the book, I was waiting for Larry scenes. That's a difference. I don't, I mean, the same guy created both and wrote both. I don't understand how it's that different. And the only way I can say is the acting performance yeah. tilts it. Uh, however, when he shows up in Boulder, he's just randomly there. You don't see him really meet Stu or anything. He's just in a scene with Stu all of a sudden and okay, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, once they, they, they kind of, there's a lot of stuff on the on the road to Boulder. Like after you know a bunch of the characters all meet Mother Abigail, and then they all mm-hmm. road trip to Boulder. Once that group of characters reaches Boulder, there's like what one or two shots of a bunch of vehicles coming to Boulder, and then literally the next scene is like a whole huge crowd of people all together. Like yeah. that's literally the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Franny Goldsmith is played by the great Molly Ringwald, who everyone oh, knows. Oh my lord. Everyone knows for, from all those movies that everyone loves from the 80s. Um, and I think she's really good in this, too. She is great in this movie. She looks absolutely gorgeous. Like, uh-huh. you can see why, you know, Stu would have a thing for her, like, obviously. Mm-hmm. And she's she's amazing. Like, she she gives a really, really great performance as well. I The one thing I really dislike about Franny, and I don't know if it's this way in the book as well, but... I don't, I don't know if this was something that maybe they just omitted because they wanted to get to the plot with flag and Vegas and everything, but she really gets sidelined in like chapter three, especially like parts three and four. There's like almost no Franny. Yeah. And then parts one and two, you get so much Franny. Like she's a huge, huge character, but then yeah, once she gets the boulder and gets knocked up, she just kind of gets relegated to, all right, you're knocked up, go away duty. Like, you know, she's just not really as much of a presence. I don't, is it like that in the book too? No, she she plays a pretty important part. She yeah. she actually sees that the bomb is going to go off um, during the meeting session, so she kind of sounds the alarm, and that's when Nick dies because he kind of goes after it for whatever reason, which seems dumb. Uh, and her pregnancy is there all along. It isn't just randomly brought up. Like when I was, yeah, she's in- pregnant before she ever meets Stu in the book, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She, she's she's pregnant all along. She got knocked up with this dude she was seeing. And uh I don't know. It just she she just is randomly pregnant and it's never addressed beforehand and then hey, I'm pregnant. Like after they finally find Stu and they get back and it's like, you know, almost the epilogue of the miniseries yeah. where like she has the baby and then the doctor comes in and is like, Oh yeah, the baby is fine. The babies will be immune to it, no problem. We're good. I wish they would have played with that more. Like, I wish they would have played more with that idea of 
like the like literally the end of the world like literally like we're the last of humanity like can we even have children like i wish there mm-hmm. would have been that conversation in the mini series and i mean again this might be my ignorance of the book and you know you can fill me in on it but i would love it if that kind of thing made it in to the 2020 where there's that whole other side to the fact that yeah we survived captain trips we're the 0.1 percent of humanity that survived captain trips but uh is it still around? Can we even have children? Can we continue on? Or is the human race doomed? Like, is this the end of us as a species period? You know? Yeah. Uh, in the book, there was a bunch of pregnant women that had joined up and a lot of the babies did not survive. Franny's dead. It kind of fought off the, it wasn't immediately immune. It kind of just naturally fought it off. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the, it, it's a good, it's a, I hope the character wasn't just included just for that reason. Like, well, what about humanity? Oh, here you go. Yeah, but she is. A she's sh- a great character in the in the first mm-hmm. two in the first two parts. But yeah, she really gets sidelined once they get to Boulder. You basically don't really, especially in part four, you see almost nothing of her. Yeah, she's uh she's a little bit smarter in the book as well. She discovers that Harold and Nadine are up to no good. Her and Larry break into Harold's house and discover he's been writing uh, a journal about how he wants to kill Stu and everyone else, and um, so she's she's got a more lot more wherewithal. Which brings us to Harold Lauder, who you can't stand. Dear Christ! Oh my Lord! <laughs> uh, this is the most insufferably bad performance in the entire miniseries. It's 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 like. The performance that we get for Larry on steroids, it's, 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 he is so, he almost like the way he plays the character is like, he's annoyed to even be there. Like he's annoyed to even be acting in this. Like, why is he annoyed literally all the time? Yeah. Why? He's he's just pissed off constantly. Yeah. Like, I just want to throat punch him. Like every time he's on the screen, he's insufferable, insufferable. And it's like, dude, like, I get that you're hot for Franny, but, like, you are batting so far out of your league. It's, like, they have that scene with Stu, like, where he's, he's like, being a giant asshole to Stu, like, when they yeah. first show up and they first meet. Yeah. And Stu has to pull him aside, and he's like, look, dude, I'm not, I'm not trying to go after your girl or anything. What Stu really should have said is, like, dude, you not in a million years. Never, <laughs> right. never. She wouldn't even trip over something and accidentally fall over and brush her hand past your dick on the way to the ground. Yeah. Like never, in, never in a million years. You practically, like, you, like, you practically are the last man on earth and she's still not gonna. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. As well, that's as far as they know for that moment. Right. He is the last man on earth. Like he, <laughs> li- he literally is like, yeah, why, it would have been a much better scene to me. And I would have just loved it. Cause I hate Harold so much if Stu would have just hauled off and laid him out like right there, just laid him out Mm -hmm. like fine. Like it it could still motivate Harold the same way because he's like really mad at Stu and you could get some good character moments between the two of them to, to have like a back and forth dialogue about like, uh, dude, I'm just trying to get to, I'm just trying to get to, and like the whole insistence on going to Vermont to go to the CDC, like, is it so annoying? Yeah. It's, I really, really, really hate Harold as a character at the writing for the character I hate, uh, you're meant to, you're meant to. So yeah, good work, Steven. But the performance of the character is it's, t- it's terrible. Like he's not hateable in that man. I love to hate this character. I despise that character. I literally, I literally want to stand up and applaud every time it gets to that moment when he pulls the gun out and blows his own head off after he gets <laughs> into the bike crash at the beginning of part four, yeah. I want to stand up and cheer. It's the greatest moment in this entire mini series. <laughs> the scene where he is making the bomb that he intends to take out the council and uh, Nadine comes down and starts talking and he he goes, you're messing with my disco or something. He's got some <sighs> shitty disco song. <laughs> just the line delivery and the fact that that was said just, ah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you have the chance 2020 2020 limited series. You have the chance to right the wrongs. There are very few wrongs of the 1994 miniseries. I love it. I really do. Yeah. But please, for the love of God, give us a better Larry and give us a better Harold. Larry, they're actually uh, Larry's actually uh, Yovana Depo is Larry 
in the new one. So they actually did a race flip. Oh, okay. On which on is, that one, which is and fine. he's a great actor. Uh, he's yeah. he's he was in. Um, did you see Overlord? No, I did not. It looked interesting, um, but yeah, he was he was in Overlord, and he was uh, he was the son in Fences, which was actually my number one movie of the year that it came out. Oh, okay. Uh, and he was actually really, really, really great in that. And he's been in a lot of uh, he's been in a lot of other really, really good stuff. So I would definitely, definitely pay more attention to him. But yeah, so he's going to be our Larry, and he, like I said, that to me, we're already going to get a better Larry. Yeah, I don't know anything, unfortunately, about the guy that they cast to play Harold in the new one, Owen Teague. I've never seen anything he's in, so. And, yeah. and you know what? I'm I'm more than okay with them race flipping Larry. Like he's described in the book as uh, singing like a black man, anyways. So why not? And by the way, this virus hits, and there's like only two black people left in the entire country. <laughs> <laughs> the, the judge and mother abigail uh yeah you can we can we can put more people of color in this it's okay i'm all right both, with of, both of whom get killed yeah uh, yeah know. exactly so it's like yeah okay all white people are left uh, yeah it's uh yeah so yeah th- no i i really really of course larry dies anyway <laughs> yeah true <laughs> I, mean, I really true. really i really I, I really really like that and hey you know what if they give us like a hip-hop version or something like that of of baby can you dig your man? Yeah. Like please? they should, they should. I'm on, I'm all for that. I'm literally all for that. I do know that, uh, Marilyn Manson has been cast in a supporting role. They haven't said as who, but he also recorded a cover of the doors, the end to play on the soundtrack. So I don't know if that's going to be come there. Uh, don't fear the reaper or what, but who on earth could he be playing? I don't know. I thought maybe Trash Can Man was my initial guess, but I'm not that sure. Be, that would be really, 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 really interesting. Yeah, anybody he plays is going to be interesting. I feel like because I can't really put a finger on who he would play, quite honestly. But that was the one that popped into my head is Trash Can Man, who's played by Matt Frewer in this, and. Uh, I don't know. Matt Frewer does a great job, I guess. He is so good. I mean, he makes that character like he really sinks into it. Like, like when he's getting tormented, like when he hears the bullies in his head mm-hmm. and everything, like he's really, really great. Just kind of showing the anguish that that character goes through. And like, I mean, it's one of the most my brother loves this miniseries, too. And I know uh-huh. he loves Trash Can Man. So literally he would watch this miniseries. And then my brother would like randomly be doing stuff. And he'd be like, boom, dee, boom, dee, boom, dee, boom, dee, boom. <laughs> like like that. He is one of one of the most endearing characters in this entire story now our very own god of podcasting on the epic film guys we were talking about the stand uh yesterday when we recorded our review of inception okay for its 10-year anniversary and he did make a mention of something that i also tend to agree with and that we can talk about it more when we talk about the end of this if you want okay. to but um it it, it the, the ending of the the ending of the the miniseries at, at the very least is very very trash can man ex machina yes like absolutely it, it's just like randomly, he just randomly shows up and blows everybody up. Like he, he's a plot device, and that's all he is. And it, yeah, it's what, kind of like I really wish there would have been more to bringing Flag down than, yeah, here's this really mentally unstable guy that Flag really latched himself onto for whatever reason, not for whatever reason suspecting that hey, maybe this isn't the best idea. Right, exactly. <laughs> he's the one guy that's so unstable, even Flag can't control him. Yeah, so uh, it's like, you know, you can have a million Lloyds that are disposable that you can let it, let them let them play around with nukes and get radiation poisoning because you don't care, but you know why do you get like this one dude who you're like, oh yeah, this guy, I love this guy. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, Matt, yeah, but, but he doesn't fit in in Boulder either though. Like, what do you no. do with trash if he shows up in Boulder? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Matt Frewer does a great job, and I feel like he, he does, does a lot with nothing he's not given a lot to work with other than to be a plot device um yeah he's a pyromaniac he has that aptitude for weapons he knows weapons and um in the book it he pretty much has a shining but it's only for weapons he can find them pretty much anywhere that's how he's able to randomly find the nuke in the desert at the end of the movie um the makeup effects at the end of trash 
when trash can is dying of radiation poisoning and his face Dude. is melting off. He looks a lot like Deadpool to me, and I'm wondering if the na- makeup effects artist saw this movie and was like, hey, Deadpool. You know what he also looks like to me? I don't know if you're familiar with the Fallout series at all, like the video game series. Yeah, yeah. He looks like a ghoul. Oh, he okay. looks like a ghoul in Fallout. Oh, I wonder if that was intentional too, I bet. I I wonder, like I yeah. wonder if they if they drew inspiration for the design of the ghouls from that, because yeah, that's exactly what I, when I saw him, and I mean, of course, when I first saw this, you know, Fallout wasn't even a thing, so I I saw him, I was just like, he looks just like a ghoul. Yeah. <laughs> if he if he calls somebody a smooth skin, then I'm out of here. But uh, we should also mention there's uncredited cameos by Kathy Bates, fresh off, who her. is so good at this movie. She's oh, she's amazing. Fuck, dude. This this was right after she played Annie Wilkes in Misery, and I guess she just did it as a favor for Stephen King, but she's so good, and I wish that character was in it more. So, so good. I mean, what else do you do with that character, yeah, really, I don't besides know. just kind of use her to to sow fear and whatever else? Like, it, it is a great, great, this random one-shot performance, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we have Ed Harris as a corrupt military general. Who is also just so... So good. Yeah. This this entire cast is really, really good with a few exceptions. It's yeah. It's spot on. Um I guess we can talk about the ending now. And uh, I'm just gonna say it. I hate the ending. I can't stand uh, the ending. I cannot stand the ending. It's the same as the book. Cannot stand the uh, ending. Ah, see what I did stand. there. You're very clever to catch that. I don't like it. I don't like it. The ending they're in Las Vegas. Larry and Ralph are uh, going. It's a public display. Their limbs are going to be ripped from their bodies. Flags gathered everybody to basically flaunt his power. Trash Can Man shows up with a nuke he found in the desert. Um, there's some uprisings. Flag stops the uprisings with this magical electrical powers he's never had before. Yep. And those magical electrical powers turn into a giant hand, the hand of God. And you hear yep. Mother Abigail's voice, and the hand uh, knocks on the nuke, and it blows up Las Vegas and everybody else. Yep. And that's the ending, basically. And I hate it. I yep. can't stand it. It, it. First of all, it looks cheesy as shit. It really does. <laughs> it looks so bad. And... I mean, I know it's not. I know the the effects back then weren't what they are now, but it still it doesn't look good, and I think it's stupid. Like you invested all this time, there's literally no reason for Ralph or Larry to go on that journey at all. It's just yeah. That and that's the and that's the thing too. It's like it, at the end of chapter three, she tells the four of them. You have to leave now with the clothes on your backs. Don't eat. Don't do anything. Literally just leave and go to Vegas and confront Flag. That's what you have to do. That's what God told me you have to do. I heard yeah. whatever. But then, yeah, literally they are they do nothing for the resolution of the entire plot because it's trash that just randomly shows back up. And then Mother Abigail randomly decides to detonate the nuke. Yeah. Like, why did you need these guys to walk across the desert? Yeah. You could have had just trash show up in Las Vegas and the nuke still blow up and all of tra- all of Flag's people still would have went. Yeah, it's 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 a really really I I've never ever really been the biggest fan of it, but then like even like now watching it, even like I, I'm much more of a critical person than I yeah. ever was, you know, back when I originally watched it. And now watching it, it's just like this is the most anticlimactic shit. Yeah. Like ever. I li- what? I literally huh? cringed when I saw it again. I could not believe how bad it was. I, yeah. Uh, Cause I uh, And it's just like literally like Flag can't do anything to stop him. Literally nothing. Like he just stands there kind of, and then he turns into his demon face and then he just sits there and yells. Like it's like nuclear man and Superman and Superman (laughs) four where he's attacking people in Metropolis and Superman just stands there and is like, no, the people, but does nothing to stop him from hurting them. Well, it's because nuclear man has those nuclear fingernails and that is true. They will scratch the shit out of that Superman. 
which, ooh, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. By the way, when I saw that as a kid in the theater, it terrified me. So mission accomplished, (laughs) nuclear man. (laughs) Oh, my Lord. I just... It's definitely anticlimactic. After you spent all this time with these people and this great story, it really drops the ball. And, um, I mean, usually Stephen King stuff, they end pretty good, pretty decently, I think. Um, But this, I don't know. I don't know what you could have done differently. I would have even appreciated if Larry hit Flag in the face with a guitar or something random. Like they don't even have any interaction with them, quite honestly. It's, yeah. it's just they're literally just there to just get killed. That's literally the only reason they're there. Like if there was if there was something where like even if Mother Abigail had, had like I I don't know like like maybe like they become angels or something and like because they were there they're able to get to the nuke and detonate it and blow it up and whatever at least mm-hmm. that's something else even yeah. that sounds even cheesy even when I say right. it out loud that sounds pretty bad it's at least them taking part in the finale of the of the story though like literally she has them trudge across the desert Stu breaks his leg and almost dies until Tom Cullen randomly finds him yeah which is i love those little scenes with those two though at the uh-huh. end when, when yeah. tom's like really nursing good. him back to health and nick shows up in a dream and is like no come on you got to go get him antibiotics let's go get him something that's actually uh-huh. going to help him here yeah and and saves him did you know did you know that when they were casting for the 2020 miniseries as is it's outrage culture every everything that happens so deaf actors apparently were outraged that a, a hearing actor was cast as Nick in the 2020 version oh. and the director had to fire back and be like, but this character can hear and he can talk in dreams because Tom dreams about him all the time. Right. And we only see it once in the miniseries, but I, it, I, I know it's a much bigger thing in the book. It is, yeah. It's like, yeah, like he's, we, he can hear and he can talk in those scenes. Like he's not a deaf mute in like, you know, like whatever. So we have to have an actor who can hear and who can talk. You know, it's just like, like, I get, like, I get it. And you want more opportunities and everybody should have more representation. Right. We don't want to say that, but can you please pick your fucking battles and not just get outraged, like willy nilly about everything, please. Yeah. It's amazing. Please. It's amazing what people take their stands on. Ah, uh, nah, see what <laughs> I did there. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so it is coming to CBS all, all access. Uh, a reboot, uh, uh, a new version. Nick and I both decided we're going to be all about it. Um, I can't wait. I honestly, and, and literally what we should do is we should do some kind of, uh, you know, it's it's going to be 10 episodes too. Like what, what I would even be game for is like literally, and, we, and we're not going to start a podcast about it because then it would no. be 10 episodes and it would be over. But like literally I would, honest to God, like after they're over, like we both watch them, like sit down and just talk about, each episode like after it airs like kind of record a review of it and like air it on both of our shows or whatever i don't know yeah, i'm down cogs are let's, turning yeah let's do that that sounds good to me i love that idea just like sitting down and, and reviewing because i'm gonna i'm gonna guess because it's a 10 episode limited series i'm gonna guess that they're gonna release it episodically even though it's gonna be on a streaming platform i'm gonna guess they're gonna release it incrementally it's not all gonna be like here's the whole thing bam i think so because wasn't picard released uh episode by episode i I think maybe i I don't know because i i've avoided cbs all access like the plague because i'm like i literally would not pay any amount of money to be able to watch the big bang theory so (laughs) yeah well and you shouldn't because you can turn your tv on right now and it's on some channel i guarantee yeah yeah, i'm sure yeah uh (laughs) But the the stand this version's going to be written by Stephen King and his son Owen King, who is also a uh, a fiction writer, not as popular as Joe Hill, who I love. Um but we're in the middle of a a Stephen King resurgence and it's pretty great. Uh we got it is. We got Castle Rock on Hulu, which I haven't watched, but I want to. Uh the It movies, a remake of Pet Cemetery, Gerald's game on Netflix, which was pretty amazing. Um, that Pet Cemetery was not. Pet Cemetery all. was not. I had no desire to see that. I'm like the original's fine. Why would you bother? See, I've never seen the original, oh, okay. and like, I'm curious to see the original now because everybody tells me it's a lot better. But yeah, then it's terrible. It's just not good. 
uh, he, S- Stephen King just came out with uh, a uh, book of four novellas, and like all four of those have already been optioned in the last week. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, there's going to be more Stephen King coming, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's one of those things where he's just going to hit a resurgence, and I I'm really really glad because you remember like they've been trying to do another adaptation of the stand for at least like ten years or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They wanted to do at first at first somebody like I think even before the miniseries was developed because King wanted George Romero to direct a movie version of it. Yeah, he did. But they could not get the script condensed down into a feature film length. And think about how could you ever this much material condense it down into one movie? Well, they ever. tried it with the Dark Tower, which was a yeah. seven so like massive books into one ugh. movie. Really, doesn't. I don't work. know how on earth you would ever get that but then like i think it was sometime around the 2010s or like the end of the the end of the aughts as they're known where they were trying to option like a multi-picture deal like they were going to do two or three feature length movies i think it was the same guy that does that that's behind the 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 limited series too, josh boone Mm -hmm. Uh, i want to say it's the same guy like that was originally his plan was to do like two or three feature length films and like that's that would be fine i guess and i would love to see this on the big screen like i'd love it i mean well covid notwithstanding right but i would love to see all 10 of these episodes on the big screen like that would be glorious but i'm kind of glad we're getting it in a limited series format where we're getting it expanded out to 10 hours there's so 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 much more and i don't even know what detail the book goes into but like even watching the mini series i'm so curious about what happens in the rest of the world is everybody oh, yeah. just dead were no. all the survivors just in America because they all go to Boulder and Las Vegas? Like, was there anybody left anywhere else? Did they have the same crazy dreams? Did each culture have its own Randall Flag and Mother Abigail? Like, I have so many questions about, like, what's life like in Europe after Captain Trips? Yeah, I thought the same thing. Like, uh, the book really doesn't say what's going on in the rest of the world. But when I was reading it, especially, I thought of that. I'm like, well, is there some supernatural critter in paris or something you know is there yeah. what's going on which i mean if you want to do be like, great if you just randomly see like if, like all of a sudden they're in boulder and like a whole bunch of like different european people show up and they're all speaking different languages and stuff and like oh yeah we took a boat and we came over because we had dreams about this old woman who still makes her own bread <laughs> like, yeah honestly i wouldn't even be mad if like the stand is a hit on cbs all access and they're like here's a season two and it takes place in australia or something I would be all right with that, with a whole new cast. There's so much more you can do with this world, and there's so much more you can do here in terms of in terms of building this world out, fleshing this world out, and whatnot. Um, Because there is one part of the book where Stu talks about meeting a man like Randall Flagg, and it's so stupid. This story, so stupid. (laughs) But I, it alludes to like other supernatural beings in the world because the stand is one of the things that. Uh, most of Stephen King's stuff takes place in the same exact world, but the stand, obvious yeah. for obvious reasons, takes place in an alternate reality or whatever. But uh, Stu alludes tells Franny a story about meeting a man like Randall Flagg, um, and it, it was a guy with like glowing eyes, and he's really supernatural and charismatic, and blah blah blah. Turns out he was talking to Jim Morrison's ghost, <laughs> and that's that's literally written in the book. <laughs> It's so stupid, and I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's so stupid. Like, why? Why is this here? Why? What? What commentary is there? God damn it, East Texas! What did they do to him in Vermont up there? Yeah, really. That's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite whole parts of of this is kind of the way that they keep him locked away in this in this room because everybody else that they bring. Which here's here's the thing. Here's the thing about this too, Randy. This disease is so deadly and it spreads so much so fast. Why is their best idea of a quarantine to take everyone that lives in, you know, East Texas and whatever the name of the town is, I can't remember right now, but their idea of quarantining them is to pack them all into transports and, <laughs> and take, take them, them across other the places. Yeah. <laughs> what? Like they literally take them all the way to goddamn Vermont. Yeah. Like, are you like, what? 
Yeah. Like, it's like, that's the exact opposite of what a quarantine is. Yeah. They <laughs> like, went through the trouble of blocking off the town, and then they went ahead and flew all those people yeah, across the Yeah, everybody that had contact with, with Campion, the guard that had escaped from, the guard that had escaped from the thing, everybody that had, everybody that had come in contact with them in the town, yeah. they pack them on a goddamn transport and take them to Vermont. Like, uh, what? Yeah. Ugh. I just, like, I don't understand, like, the, the, even the sensibility behind that. I mean, I guess you just need to be, like, it's already human-engineered, the viruses. Like, it was already humans causing their own downfall, and that's bad enough. But I, I, honestly, I don't think that the miniseries needs to relocate them at all for any reason. No. Like, at all. No. Like, because it kind of... What is it? I mean, the only thing it really does is it puts Stu on the on the road to meet Franny, to meet Glenn, and all the people that he ends up meeting Anyways. along the way on his way to Boulder. That's really the only reason, but I wouldn't mind. Like, I don't know how much they're going to change or what's going to be different. We do know that they're going to do chronological jumps, so I have read that the miniseries will start in Boulder. Like, it starts with the people in Boulder cleaning up the dead bodies and making the boulder free zone yeah and then as we get to learn and know about the characters in the present of boulder we're going to flash back and see how the pandemic affected them and how they ended up getting to boulder yeah which i think is a great idea honestly i do too yeah i think it's a good way to do it because you yeah if you've i mean this mini series is pretty close to perfect i don't know how you adapt the material better so I guess yeah. you do it in a different way. Um, yeah, which is which is uh, again that is just absolutely fantastic because it'll it allows you to to get into a lot more character nuance and whatnot, mm -hmm. and then it kind of allows you to play thematically with different character arcs as well. Like where were they here and where were they here? It, it allows you to do a lot a lot of different stuff. But I would not mind whatsoever if they just decided to change a lot of origins of a lot of things i know i know purists people that love the book would be like don't you dare say that but like what sense on earth does it make nobody looked at this and was like wait they're quarantining them so they pack them on a transport and take them to vermont literally halfway across the country yeah why why yeah tell me why i mean even then like i mean Campion and Ed Harris has that great scene where he's basically just like whoever, anybody that, you know, any place where Campion stopped to get a burger or stopped to take a piss or whatever, like the virus is going to spread from there and spread from there. There's nothing we can do to stop it, et cetera. Yeah. You know, it's just. There's a great line in the book where one of the characters that has been in contact with Campion goes to a diner and the last line in the chapter is he le left her a tip. It was crawling with death. I'm like, that's so yeah. beautiful. Um, that is great. I love that. Uh, Stephen King is going to write a continuation of The Stand. He said in the 10th episode of this uh, upcoming miniseries. So it's a continuation of the story. And the complete and uncut edition of the book that I read, um, It the, the epilogue of the story is uh, Randall Flagg waking up on some island somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and there's uh, primitive people there, and they are immediately in awe of him and start... Who love sexy jeans, apparently. Uh, apparently so. Yeah. Actually, he it says that he's still wearing his sexy jeans and cowboy boots. So there you go. And uh, they immediately start bowing down, and he starts smiling, and he says, my name is Russell Faraday, and I'm going to lead you or whatever. So I, maybe that's... Uh, a thing they could explore in future seasons or something, if that's the direction they so choose. But yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. It's, it it's, it's interesting to see. There's just so much, there's so, so much that they could do with all of it that I really, really hope a lot of these characters, especially the characters that just didn't get the depth that they deserved in the miniseries, like because there just wasn't enough time. I mean, realistically, that's what they did. They went through, they cast all these big names. They cast your Gary Sinise's and your Molly Ringwalds and your Ray Walston's and all this, all these characters. So then you're just not left with, you know, anything to do for your Ralph's and your Dana's even, and like all these other characters that have these pivotal moments in the plot. And then like when, like when Dana ends up in Vegas and gets killed, who cares? 
<laughs> yeah. You just you just don't care. Yeah, you don't even know her at all. Yeah, like you've literally seen her like once or twice. Like she's the girl that is she, yeah, isn't she she's like when that one somebody's having a baby that Stu's trying to deliver the baby. No, somebody's having an appendicitis attack yeah, or something. Yeah. And Stu's trying to take out their appendix and like she's in that scene and then like the next scene is her being picked as a spy <laughs> and then seducing Lloyd. Yeah. And then getting, you know, like st- killing herself or dying or whatever. I just, what? Yeah. <laughs> and I, honestly, those scenes made me want to see that character more too, because yeah. she she rigged up a, a knife thing in her in her shirt sleeve to stab Randall Flag, and like she she's got a lot of. And he turns it into a banana. Yeah. <laughs> wah wah wah. He's a jokester. I would just, Love to see more. There's so much more that they can wring out of the existing characters that got a lot of depth and especially the ones that didn't like, there's just so, so, so much more. I, I can't wait to see more of the, more of the pandemic, more of people dying from the super flu. I really, really can't wait to see how much more in depth they're going to go with, because they're going to, literally have another four hours of screen time in a, a, across 10 episodes of the limited series to play with. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's going to be great. Here's a piece of trivia I found right before we started recording. Uh, Matt Frewer, who played Trash Can Man, and Bill Fagerbeck, who played Tom Cullen, reunited on a project after the stand the next year. They provided the voices of Lloyd Christmas and Harry Dunn in an animated series of Dumb and Dumber, which I had no I exi- no idea existed, but it was produced by Hanna Barbera, and the character designs are ridiculous, and I can't believe it's a thing that exists in this universe. But so I guess Matt Frewer would play Lloyd, yeah. and Bill Fogerbach would play Harry. Yes. Wow, <laughs> that's all you could say about that, really. Wow, indeed. It sounds like it's probably about as good as the Napoleon Dynamite animated series was, even though that was voiced by the cast of the movie, but still. Well, from what I gather, they included a talking purple beaver also in the animated series. Why the fuck not? (laughs) Might as well. Might as well. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Right. Uh, Well, this has been fun, Nicholas. This has been a hoot, huh? Laws, yes. Laws, yes. We should uh, definitely do your idea and uh, record about. I'm the... down for that. Yeah. We, again, we still don't know when. Yeah. Sometime this year is the is the smart money because they finished production. They wrapped shooting in March before COVID shut everything down. So I'm sure COVID is slowing down post production. But I mean, literally, it's effects and editing and whatnot. You know, you can do that while you're you know quarantined or whatever. Right. Hopefully, so hopefully. Hopefully we'll we'll see this before the end of the year or very early next year uh, at, at whatever case. And then, yeah, I I I literally like this is like, you know this is uh, I I don't have a ton of exposure to Stephen King like a lot of people, but this would easily be my favorite Stephen King thing ever aside from uh, Stand by Me, of course, mm-hmm. which is also amazing. Yeah, but I just I love 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 this miniseries. I love the performances in it. Yeah, it's got its flaws. And yeah, it's got a couple of, you know, really, really bad performances. But it's still really, really, like, there's just something so heartwarming when Ruby D's like, I'm 108 years old and I still make my own bread. I know. It's so great. Just love it. Like, you you just want to go to Heming- Hemingford Home, Nebraska, like, uh-huh. right then. You're just like, I'm going to pause this. Hang on. <laughs> right. Uh I would love to yeah. have you on to do because I just recently saw you've never seen Beetlejuice. I'd love to have you yeah, on not. to do that. Maybe Storm of the Century, which was another Stephen King thing that came out after this. Whatever, we're up to. Oh, <laughs> I got an eye roll for that one. You pick my brain, sir, and I will be here for okay. it. Because if if canon quarantine has proven nothing, I will watch literally anything and See? talk about it for hours. We should definitely do Beetlejuice, though. It's one of my favorite movies, and I'm curious. Because we don't always agree on when it comes to films, what you would think of the Beetlejuice. Um, I'd be curious. I'd be curious to see it. I mean, it's it's is is it? It's a lot of '80s movies for me mm-hmm. because I didn't see them when I was a kid because I didn't experience them when I was younger. 
they don't play for me at all as a, as an adult. That's why I famously hate the Goonies because I'm like, this movie sucks, guys. But it's, everybody that's seen it as a kid is like, no, it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah, it's not that great. I, I side mm. with you on that. It's not that great. I'll watch it every now and then, but I realize it's not the best. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, if if you carry if if it's just nostalgia, I get that. I yeah. get it. I I love some movies because they're terrible, but I have nostalgic attachments to them. Mm-hmm. But yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> some things are very very firmly. I wonder how and I I'd, I'd be really curious to know about the 1994 version and hopefully when the 2020 limited series comes out it kind of revives interest in people checking out the original, you know, mini series because it got a Blu-ray release. It got a Blu-ray re-release. Did it really? I it should, did, yeah. I should it get did. that. So it's it's I would be really interested to see. I mean, it is very, very 90s. Mm-hmm. There's no removing the 90s-ness from it. I would be really interested to see what a fresh set of eyes would think about this miniseries just by itself. I mean, obviously, they're going to see a lot of people that they recognize that are still, you know, acting today and whatnot. But I would love, 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 love to 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 hear some opinions from people that have never seen the original miniseries. It is still floating around there. I got my copy at Walmart for five bucks. It was in their yeah. five dollar bin, which is a shame, but you know, at the same time, and I, I and I feel like the DVD itself was manufactured in 1995. It's really, really bad. However, <laughs> there it is. It's somebody it's l- somebody literally had one of those DVD VCR combos, and they it, just put the put the master of the DVD in there, and they just recorded it off of a VHS, and that's what you get. Yeah, it, that's what it looks like. It literally freezes up on me, and whatever. It, yeah, no, I watched done. a Blu-ray. I watched a Blu-ray cut of this, like a re-release of it in okay. HD, and it looks great. Like it looks really, really good. I mean, awesome. aside from like I said, the effects are wonky as hell. Yeah. The effects just do not look good uh with him transforming into the demon head and stuff. Like the stuff where like it's simple effects, like the glowing eyes and like that kind of stuff, that stuff looks really, really great. And I I do love that like there's those scenes where when he creates the little those stones, mm-hmm. like it's yeah. just a, it's literally just a jump frame. Like you can see the frame cut out of it like really really quickly while they while they switch shots or whatever like i love that kind of thing like that those still look great but mm-hmm. yeah some effects and then like the hand of god and like the ball of energy that electrocutes the guys at the end and, uh, and no it looks like a 1994 tv cgi is what it looks like yeah because that's what it is the, <laughs> this was at the point where i wish they were still doing practical effects rather than leaning on starting to lean on cgi because practical effects are still awesome like that's the one thing that this mini series can do wrong in my opinion is I don't want to see a lot of CGI stuff. Yeah, no. Um like practical effects some of those 80s horror movies the practical effects are really weird and disconcerting and I give feel give it a charm. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like it certainly gives it a charm. Um and you wonder how did they actually pull that off because I mm. I don't know who would think of such a thing but I love the makeup that they do on Sheridan, like mm-hmm. the actual makeup of him in the demon guys or whatever. Like that looks great. Yeah. It's just the transformation is like, it's like the head is like liquid and it like melts. And then the <laughs> other one grows. It looks so weird. Yeah. It's, it's just like, what? Huh? <laughs> so bad. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nick did agree to do a podcast with me. We're going to start a podcast called, and I'm holding them to it. We're gonna call it the history of unimportant ideas. The hut. It's gonna be. The... I have never been more qualified to talk about anything than nothing important. See, it's gonna be the podcast rabbit hole of pop culture. Um, probably sometime at the end of this summer that'll come out. It'll be fun. In the meantime, where can people find you, sir? Epic film guys. Just Epic. search for us. You'll find us. It's not hard. Just... You guys. Listen, you guys are listening. You've been doing this long enough. You know how to add a show to your podcatcher. Put us in there. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's one of the best damn movie programs on the entire World Wide Web. Listen to you. Listen to you. Laws, yes. Laws, yeah. M-O-O-N. That spells podcast. Yeah. In the meantime, check out the big dumb comedy show known as Miserable Retail Slave. And head on over, for crying out loud, to that MiserableRetailSlave.com where I've been writing blogs and whatnot, including someone's favorite movie blog, where I uh, write about movies that we don't cover on this program here. So well, We're all praying that Tommy will finish his stairs one day. Yeah. Uh, the, I got an episode 
ready to release in the can, and I just give it to me. Up. Fine, here, take it, take it. <laughs> That's I'm I'm gonna get on track with that. I'm getting on track with this. I've got we're recording tonight. I've got one more someone's favorite in the can, and I'm recording two more tomorrow. So woo. Man, look at you. Look, look at, at th- this is what you call this is what you call a professional, ladies and gentlemen. I did the same thing. We recorded EFG yesterday. Um last Wednesday I recorded two episodes for anniversary shows and I've got something out. No, I've got Nick's watch list stuff coming this weekend. So I've got so, so many podcast recordings. But that's what you do when, you know, quarantines are happening and global pandemics are raging and we're bringing out our dead and, you know, ringing the bell. Ah. <laughs> uh. Well, this has been a hoot. I hope you do come back for Beetlejuice. And um, we'll see you next time, all right? Thank you for having me. Absolutely.